um, closing plenary for the 2023 Women's and Gender Studies Consortium. And we just need one minute before we get things going. Um, so we'll give everybody a chance to enter the call and we'll be starting in just a moment. Stephanie, you're muted. I was actually muted. So this is the third time I said we're starting. So we are starting this time. Um, I'm Stephanie Bertolotti. My pronouns are she, her, and I am the director of the UW System Gender and Women's Studies Consortium. In my role, I work with all 13 UW System campuses um, and specifically support gender studies, queer studies, and all of our affiliate programs across the state. Um, today, I'm really delighted to welcome everybody to the second day of events for our annual conference, Sustaining Hope, Feminism's Freedom in the Future, which is co-convened by the Office of the Gender and Women's Studies Librarian's Office and the Women's and Gender Studies Consortium. This conference has a 40-year-plus history across the University of Wisconsin system and beyond, and this is the third year that we have been able to offer it in a virtual format. For this session, we are also utilizing CART or Communication Access Real-Time Translation Services from the McBurney Disability Resource, Resource Center, and you can access CART through the link provided in chat or through the Zoom um, enabled closed captioning option um, icon that's also on your screen. We will also have two ASL interpreters on this call, also from the Ms. McBurney Disability Resource Center. And um, we thank this entire team for their support, not only for this event, but also for the entire conference. At this point, um, I'm going to briefly hand things over to Dr. Carla Strand, the co-convener for this conference, to introduce herself and the office. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Carla Strand. I'm the Gender and Women's Studies Librarian for the University of Wisconsin System. I also um, have a couple of columns with Ms. Magazine, and I welcome you all to, uh, to this afternoon's session. Great. Thank you, Carla. Well, I am super excited um, to introduce our um, artist roundtable today. But before um, we get started, there is um, something else that we wanted to do. And um, one of the nice things about the virtual conference is we're able to showcase the work of amazing artists like the ones that are gathered here today, and also the scholarship and research of um, faculty, academic staff, students, and community members um, across Wisconsin and beyond. And each year, um, we take a little bit of time to recognize outstanding scholarship in the gender and women's studies classroom across UW system. And this year, um, I wanted to just take a moment to recognize the 2023 Women's and Gender Studies Consortium Award nominees. And I'm going to say um, each person in their campus and the name of their project verbally, and then we'll drop a link to um, their projects in chat, and you can learn a little bit more about their research um, and all of the really amazing um, feminist and intersectional work that they're doing through senior honors theses and other projects um, on all campuses across our state. So the first nominee is Sawyer Reed, and Sawyer is a student at UW-Whitewater and has a project entitled A Trans Manifesto. Brooke Cartwright is a student at UW-River Falls, and Brooke's project is entitled ABCs and learning how to please. Perceptions on the effectiveness of sexual education attitudes towards sexual liberation and chosen sexual projects. Brecken Sargent is a student at the University of Wisconsin La Crosse, and Brecken's project is entitled Exploring the Impact of Racial Migration Microaggressions on the Academic Performance of Students of Color. Rachel Lichman is a student at UW Madison with a project entitled Ableism, 
disability, and systemic injustice in the lives of runaway youth and youth considering running away. Kateri Anderson is from UW Stevens Point with a title in, with a project entitled Intersectional Empowerment, Gender and Class Identity. Michael Wilson is from UW Stout with a project entitled Breaking the Mold, Explorance, Exploring the Experiences of LGBTQIA Plus Students. Isabel Ricker is another student from UW Madison with a project entitled Paid Leave in Parenting examining family leave policies through the experiences of UW Madison faculty. And our final student that I'll recognize today is Sam Starks, a student at UW Madison in the project of Sam's, um, the title of Sam's project is Decolonizing Spatial Design with Modular Fashion, Building Sustainable Bodies and Building Sustainable Environments. And again, um, we'll drop the link um, to the student award nominee. Oh, it just hit the chat now. Um, some of the students um, had the opportunity to record their, their projects so you can see them in the asynchronous mode and leave comments. Um, but everybody there is recognized for all of their um, outstanding scholarship and work. And also thank you to the faculty and staff that support these projects on a daily basis. I am now delighted to hand things over to Gabrielle Javier Cirilli, who is going to start the introduction for our artist roundtable panel today, and will also be facilitating um, the panel. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabrielle Javier Cirilli, and um, before I do my introduction, real quick, um, Stephanie, can we get a link in the chat for the virtual art exhibit? And we'll probably talk about that at the end, but I just want to make sure we, I, I wrote it down. I don't want to forget it. All right. So I'm Gabrielle Javier Cerulli. I am the program director at Wheelhouse Art Studios at uh, Memorial Union at UW-Madison campus. I am also, I have a master's degree in art therapy. I am the author of this book, Art Journal, Your Archetypes. Um, my personal art, uh, self-taught art, artist, and I do a lot of mostly mixed media work, uh, lots of flow and um, upcycled materials are in there. Um, growing up in the, in the inner city, it definitely influences my um, style of abstract, of abstract expressionism. This was my latest piece that was in a show, it's called Potential. It's using upcycled uh, materials that I have found, but this is um, something that I created. And then I also, so that's an uh, example of my upcycle work. I also do kind of like flowy, pretty things too, to balance out the, the crazy abstracts that I do. So that's me. Uh, you can always find me at the Wheelhouse Art Studios if you need to contact me. And now I'm going to pass the baton to our uh, seven wonderful guests uh, so they can introduce themselves. And they are incredible. And I will let them tell you all about themselves. Uh, Mara, do you mind going first? Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Mara Ahmed. Um, my pronouns are she, her. And it's lovely to meet you all. And I really look forward to engaging more with your work through this conference. Um, I'm an interdisciplinary artist and independent documentary filmmaker. I was born in Lahore, raised in Brussels. I went to college in Karachi and Connecticut and have spent most of my adult life here in the US. I'm based on Long Island right now. This movement across cultures and continents has shaped me and informs my art practice and community work. I'm always trying to subvert borders and hierarchies and create some kind of interface between what is considered incompatible. Language is another focus of my work, not only in the form of political writing or efforts to decolonize language and knowledge, but also in terms of creating an alternative film language that's proudly feminist and unafraid to cross boundaries that stabilize different disciplines, genres, the linearity of time and space, as well as film structures. Ideas of home, memory, and nostalgia are constantly with me, 
especially since work on my last film, A Thin Wall, which stitches oral histories together to tell the story of the 1947 partition of India. Being South Asian and belonging to the global South are both a huge part of my identity. So colonialism and its many remnants and regimes become a useful lens for me to understand the world. I am an activist and was embedded in the Rochester community for 18 years. This is how I learned about prison abolition, the history of racism in this country, how I traveled to Standing Rock, and how I became a part of the Palestine Solidarity Movement. Currently, I'm editing a feature length documentary called The Injured Body. You can actually see a still um, right now from the film on your screen. It's a film about racism in America and includes interviews with 17 women of color. It uses dance as an additional narrative strand that speaks to oppression, the breath, and the body. I am also working on another film called Return to Sender, uh, Women of Color in Colonial Postcards and the Politics of Representation. This project for which I was awarded a NISCA grant, NISCA stands for New York State Council on the Arts, involves a short film and an art exhibition and hopes to spark discussions about the representation of women of color in our media and culture. This is a graphic um, about the film, Return to Sender. So that this film is, uh, and the art exhibition is coming up this fall, which is pretty exciting. Thank you. So just a little more background. I met <clears throat> Mara um, like a hundred years ago when her first film came out, The Muslims I Know. Yes. <clears throat> and what year was that? That was, it came out in 2008. <laughs> God, that was a long time ago. So that was a very powerful um, film with a powerful message and it, a lot of it still holds true today. So I'm excited about this new film. Uh, so congratulations, Mara. When is it, when's it actually gonna come out? So the one that's, that's called Return to Sender, which is about these uh, Orientalist depictions of women from the colonies in colonial postcards, that film is coming out on October 1st. Okay. How do you, uh, anyway. So if that, somebody wants a screening, they just contact you or contact your- okay. Yes, that would, it's, that's probably the easiest ways to contact me. Great. Thank you so much. All right, up next is Michaela. Hello, Michaela. Hello. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, excellent. Um, yes, hello. Um, so, um, yes, my name is Michaela Audrey. Um, my pronouns are she, they. Um, I am a fat white woman who, um, with short, purple hair that is shaved on the left side, cut in a bob style. I am wearing um, silver glasses um, and some necklaces. I have a lip and nose piercing. Um, I'm also wearing a black tank top that says the future is accessible in uh, white thick letters. Um, it appears to be uh, reversed in the camera. That's annoying. <laughs> <laughs> um, and um, I am in bed, but behind me are some curtains that are pastel, with little star cutouts with the sun coming through them. So that looks pretty. Um, but um, so I am an entirely self-taught artist um, uh, and disability is completely intertwined with art for me um, because um, I learned to draw digitally um, specifically because I, um, I am disabled and I learned to draw from bed. Um, I um, ba basically I became, you know, ill and, and bed bound as a teenager and I needed to 
adapt to that. And I wanted to learn to draw. So I figured out, found a way, you know, you can't just draw with pencil and paper very easily from bed or you can't paint, you can't, so what can you do? So I found a way and I learned to draw and it was, that's how I learned. And um, so as my slide here says, um, I'm a disabled digital artist. Um, I use my artistic skill to not just make art of disabled people, but for disabled people, showcasing my stance in activism um, and hope for an accessible future. To the right um, of my words, I have a self-portrait where I'm wearing the same shirt that I'm wearing right now, the future is accessible. Um, it's a part of my disabled beauty series. Um, you know, which is a series um, where I draw disabled, where I draw these portraits uh, for disabled people. Um, to the um, to the right of this here, I have um, another drawing of uh, of mine that shows a sketched crowd of disabled people with their right fist raised, some holding canes and crutches above them. And it has the hashtag, hashtag that reads, nobody is disposable above their heads. Um, and it's that's a kind of mantra that cycled disabled spaces since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, if you want to learn more about that and me and what I do, um, you can take a peek at my website. It says that at the bottom, but it seems to be cut off. Um, that's ogrefairy.com. So um, they could probably, they probably already dropped that in the chat. Um, but yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Michaela. And uh, Michaela, you're just FYI, we can see your shirt reading correctly. <laughs> so oh, okay, but in my end, for some reason, it's yeah. completely reversed. That's, that's what cameras way. do. Michaela, where yeah. are you based out of? Um, right now, I'm in Massachusetts. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, where in Massachusetts? Um, I'm in I'm in Springfield. Springfield. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Great. In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> it's, it's pretty there but it's a uh, um not much here yeah man those your your imagery is just so powerful uh mm -hmm. mcmurdy center should get some of those up in their spaces i'm gonna let mm -hmm. mcmurdy center know yeah. uh, okay well thank you so much next is tl luke she's a local madisonian i, I guess right would you say that yeah. <laughs> okay. that's what i would say yeah um, well, hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for being here today and to UW's Women and Gender Studies Consortium for inviting me to participate in this artist roundtable. Um, my name is Tia Luke. My pronouns are she, they. Um, and I'm a professional illustrator and comic artist and muralist based in Madison. Um, my early illustrations are a direct influence uh, from my time growing up in the middle of nowhere as an only child. Uh, those pieces almost always depict a fearless girl with her larger than life-size animals uh, or animal companions, I should say, in settings meant to make the audience feel a little wary. Um, one of my favorite reviews that uh, describes my work is, um, it says, whimsical but menacing, uh, which <laughs> accurate. <laughs> That's very uh, <laughs> and I didn't think to put slides together. So I quick ran and grabbed uh, one Perfect. of these early illustrations yeah. um, for my wall. Apologize. Apologies for the glare. Um, so larger <laughs> than life size millipede, you know. Um, there we go. Uh, okay, so recently uh, my art practice has shifted into um, shifted to include comic making, and I'm currently in the process of illustrating an original graphic novel that has a similar mm -hmm. vibe as the earlier illustrations, menacing but hopeful. Uh, I've also been leaning into my local activism inclinations by creating informative comics about Wisconsin issues, like last week's Wisconsin Supreme Court election. Uh, the comics positive reception, uh, including a collaboration with Julia Louise Dreyfus, uh, is inspiring a larger series of explaining state politics and other important things to know for enacting legislative progress um, in your local communities. And 
finally, uh, since starting my business in 2018, um, oh, and really quick, here's a, making a zine right now of some of these comics. Uh, so these were from, as we approached both the primary of the Wisconsin Supreme Court election and um, the actual election on April 4th. Um, uh, so since starting my business in 2018, I've had the opportunity to illustrate two feminist children's books for Learner and Rebel Girls Publishing. I've completed over 200 commissions worldwide. I've presented several art equity and ethical business practice workshops for tech companies, lawyers, museums, and emerging artists alike. And I continue to sell my own products at local markets. So if you're in Madison, I'll see you at the farmer's market uh, tomorrow. Uh, and my online store at tl-luke.com. Thank you. Uh, TL, are you going to do... Um... Uh, Willie Street, uh, Willie Street Fair, and all oh yeah, things. okay, oh Did yeah, La Fete remember? de Marquette. Uh, yeah. yeah, I have the full list on my website as well in my Great. events calendar. Yep. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Up next, um, yeah, this is this is an honor to welcome Della. Della is over in Milwaukee, and she is uh, a phenomenal collage artist who started her art making a little later than most, right, Della? I'll let you do yeah, your introduction. I, yes, um, I started making art seriously at the age 42, even though I always knew how to draw, but that really wasn't my, my interest. And I'm what they call a self-taught, I mean, the self-taught folk, outsider, brute, art brute genre which I don't really care because it feels like in the art world, in the world period, they have to label you. So basically my work is about black women and I like telling stories in my work and the women in my work, they, um, they rule their own destiny and they live in this land called Mamble Land and they're and I call them mammals and they don't take no crap off of anybody and they're yeah you know, and they just walk around this land and they just you know deal with whatever and I'm really influenced a lot about from history um what's happening in my life um I used to get real mad at people I don't get mad anymore I just make art about it and <laughs> yeah and I have uh, shown nationally and you know and internationally i'm in a over uh 100 collections and recently i'm in this book and actually another wisconsin artist is in this book too named rosemary ellison and there's phyllis thompson who used to live in milwaukee and the book is called um uh, be i think it's art beyond 70 all the artists in this book are 70 and older and is and is written by Stacy Russo. Um, I also like to think of myself as being an art provocateur because I want people to think differently about the arts, particularly about you know the history of African American artists and art of the African diaspora. There's a lot of misconceptions about about it, and um, that's it. Thank you so much, Della. Uh, you definitely have to check out her websites and uh, all her uh, social media as everybody else, because um, are you still doing, is there always the uh, surprise chicken, Della? In my collages, there is, there's always, my large collages, there's always a chicken. There's always I suppose, <laughs> I, suppose yeah. I should tell you my chicken story. Uh, <laughs> a lot of, I grew up in the 1950s and 1960s and my father was from Baltimore. My mother was from North Carolina, lived part of her life on the farm. And I should tell you, my mother also suffered from schizophrenia and she went 19 years untreated. And um, my father, when he got paid, he used to bring home a, a, a treat. It sometimes be donuts, bologna sandwiches. Um, he brought us lettuce and tomato sandwiches one time. We didn't like it. 
and uh, we, we, we didn't want that. But this particular day, he brought a chicken home. And I was about seven or eight, and I was really happy because daddy brought a pet. And was I wrong? And mm -hmm. my mother took the chicken, burned the chicken neck, and actually killed the chicken in front of me. I screamed. I hid under the bed. And guess what we had for dinner? And I would not eat chicken for a long time because basically I thought food came nice, little, neat, little packages. And I found out, no, things had to die for other things had to live. And that was really the first truth I learned in my life and my first fear. And in my land, um, the women in my artwork, they take care of their truths and their fears. And I feel that's very important because if we don't take care of our own truths and we don't take care of our fears, fears, we can't self-actualize who we're really supposed to be. And that was, you know, that was my first lesson in life. And I've taken that through all through my life that you gotta take care of your truths and fears. Thank you so much, Della. All right, up next is Christy. Hi, Christy, nice to meet you. Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Christy Lyle and uh, I am a uh, second year student in the MFA program at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And I was a working professional in higher education administration for about 30 years and decided to, um, like Adela was talking about, how to be more authentic and real. Um, I knew that art was my love and administration <laughs> wasn't. <laughs> um, and so I quit my job. I was working for a very large community college in Silicon Valley. Um, and I quit my job and packed my bags and moved to Milwaukee to start my MFA program, um, taking kind of a break. Although I do get to teach, I'm a teaching assistant um, and I, I work for a really well-known artist, Raul Deal right now. Um, I'm his assistant and I love, I'm in absolute joy and happiness. But one of the things that also happened to me that was so beautiful was that I didn't realize how much I was oppressing myself and the things that were important to me. And one of the things that popped immediately as I started working and having time to create work, artwork, which I've had to practice my entire life, but it was always in the summer. So my vacations, I went to um, art schools and Penland for you know a week of, of practice, um, but then had to go back to work. And so what happened when I started the program here was that I realized my real feelings started to come out and that I felt like I could really be more expressive of what those opinions were. And reproductive injustice is one of those focuses of my work. Um, as you can see in the website, there's a couple of my pieces up. Um, and it was beautiful because I didn't realize how oppressed I was in expressing myself because I was trying to be politically correct so that I could be a good administrator and not cause any problems and make things work well. So it's just been such a revelation and freedom um, and a beautiful, beautiful thing to uh, realize my dream as I move into kind of the third phase of my life. I'm 57 years old. And so um, to have the dream of being an artist, a full-time artist, um, and uh, hopefully an art educator as I finish my program and um, do community, uh, community work, um, uh, it's just, it's, it's so joyful. Every day is filled with so much fun. Like the concept of flow is real for me. You know, I'm like, gosh, I'm kind of hungry. Oh, it's been six hours and I haven't moved. And so I know that, uh, you know, when that happens to me and I hit that flow moment, I'm like, I am definitely in the right place. And so I'm so honored that I'm with you all and that my work is being um, represented. I just recently had um, two of the pieces that you see there was in the maid gallery, the woman maid gallery in Chicago. And so the fact that my art is getting out there and that it's being seen um, as it really expresses the authentic person that I am today, which I wasn't, you know, when I first started my program. So I'm so excited and happy to be here. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, what is your medium? What is your main medium? 
Oh, um, I'm in print and narrative forms, but I really am working with printmaking at both uh, at the 2D and 3D level. So I am in uh, also include um, sculpture, paper sculpture. Uh, so instead of uh, using, I kind of am doing quilting sculptures. So mm -hmm. instead of using fabric and thread, I'm using paper and glue um, and uh, experimenting and, and using resin in, in uh, 3D as well, which that's what the program allows me is all this beautiful experimentation with different mediums. So, right. Great. Very, very cool. Thank you. All right. Now we're, we're moving over to, an, to another uh, Milwaukee based artist here. Hello, Kirsten. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are you? Good, good. All right. Okay. So, uh, man, if you all were, if the folks who were in Madison ever got to the triennial um, art show that was here for a bit. Um, <coughs> Kirsten's pieces were bigger than me. I mean, I'm only five foot, but it, they were on the wall. And was it two or three of them, Kirsten? I was three. They're, oh. they're on the website also of a photo. Yeah, but you you have to like stand next to them to get the uh, the, the juiciness of them. All right, go ahead. So uh, what is your bio? What is your sure. background? Um, my name is Kirsten Gaznavi. I'm, uh, I say, multimedia artist, uh, illustrator. Um, I studied graphic design in Milwaukee. Uh, and I realized I did not like graphic design. <laughs> so I've always loved to draw and make things. So I just kind of went back to what I really love to do. Uh, I started making articulated paper dolls in the end of 2015, 2016. So I grabbed some that I made. So little, little like this, little girls. Oh, look how cute! <laughs> and they they started probably smaller than this, um, and now the largest ones are seven feet tall, I think, um, and and growing. So <laughs> um, I had a. A exhibition just opened at Five Points with some of my newer dolls. Um, I've been experimenting with pattern design. So I've been um, working with repeating patterns. I got some different fabrics printed with some of my patterns. And um, the name of the show is Plastic Off the Sofa. And I made a six foot long sofa for one of my dolls. <laughs> Which oh, was wow. very cool. Wow, you're getting into oh, that's very cool, Chris. That's a that's a whole different um part yeah. of your brain for you. Yeah. So um just I've been I've, as she said, I was in the triennial last year. Um I've had some work in the Racine Art Museum, um, and other places in Wisconsin and outside of Wisconsin as well. I also printed a adult coloring book a couple years ago, the oh. anti the anti adulting adult coloring book. <laughs> so I um I'm planning to make a part two to this book, but someone's been coloring in this one. <laughs> <laughs> and you're represented at you people can buy your work through um Five Point, right? Yes, I have a gallery there, um, or a gallery. I have a small studio that I share with someone there. And so I have a lot of work available. I make um, earrings, pins, and so as small as like little yeah. illustrations up to the large girls, so. Um, and didn't you start doing those little dolls like when you were super young, like with your, cause you were the oldest, yeah. um, sibling and then you would do this with your siblings right yeah I've always um as the oldest I kind of had to keep the peace in ways so one of them is just playing with my little brothers and sisters so I would a lot of times my my notebooks um the backs I would just cut those out and make dolls and then I'll do the old school with the like fold tab clothes so um and then there was a lot of tape to re to repair knees and elbows and stuff so very thank you Kirsten thank Zella you. you're not you don't have any work at a uh, five point do you anymore Della huh no you don't have any work at five point anymore do you no no I'm rep I'm represented by Portrait Society Gallery in Milwaukee also Marsha Weber Gallery in um Alabama 
Mason Fine Art in Atlanta, and and um, Main Street Gallery in Clayton, Georgia. Wow. All right. All right. Last but not least, Yvette. Yvette and I have uh, gotten uh, hot, sweaty, dirty, and had paint all over us on more than one occasion when we were both doing projects with Dane Arts Mural Arts. And I welcome you, Yvette, who is now no longer in Madison. No, that what an intro. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I'll share my screen. Uh, let's see if I can get it right on the. Uh, OK, we'll go ahead and do. There we go. So uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Yvette Ampino. I'm an Army veteran and artist and a printmaker and a curator. Uh, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I was stationed at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, where I served uh, two tours in Iraq. Uh, until recently, uh, as Gabrielle said, Madison, Wisconsin was my home, uh, but uh, my wife and I relocated to Raleigh, North Carolina in June of last year. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stop you right there. Can yeah. everybody, I cannot see her, I can't see Yvette's um, no. uh, slideshow. Can everybody see her slideshow? Here, I stopped I stopped the slideshow, let's try again. If not, it's okay, we don't. Um, can you, let's see, I'll just do, I'll share from my desktop and then maybe it'll do it that way. Can you see it now? Yes, can I can see it that way, yeah. Okay, so hopefully, can you still see the slideshow? Oh, now I got it. Okay, great. So um, uh, until recently, I was in Raleigh, uh, sorry, I was in Madison. Now I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, and I'm loving it here. I'm very humbled to be with everybody uh, on this panel today. And um, since 2017, uh, I've been the curator of veteran art at the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And even though I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, I still consult with them uh, on a weekly basis. Tonight, right after we're done here, I'll be doing my monthly drink and draw event, uh, which is a virtual event. So I'll be taking this coat off and putting my artist mock on. Um, and for the last 12 years, I've run the Veteran Print Project, uh, which is, it pairs artists with veterans to share a conversation that inspires an edition of fine art prints, which are created by the artist. Um, this is the work that I'm most well known for, uh, and I'm very proud of what uh, everything we've accomplished. These prints are my personal prints that I just um, put up. Um, I'm also a practicing artist, as you can see in these prints. And after years of considering the realities of the celebrated militarism in this country and my role within that narrative, uh, I'm now trying to return to the roots of my own personal history. Um, so. Uh, my work is transitioning from using the visual language that reflects my military experiences, like you see here. Um, and it's now leaning toward new investigations of the celebrated folklore within my family's lineage and my family folklore. And I want to understand what I'm trying to understand is family behaviors that ultimately have we've chosen to reject, not we, my family has chosen to reject our Mexican lineage in favor of elevating a Spanish heritage. And I think that's a common narrative found in New Mexico. Uh, it's some something that we're taught. Um, and so I'm trying to push back. I'm trying to create a visual defense and fight back against that denial of my identity, that denial of my Mexican uh, heritage. And you'll always see many layered symbols within my work. Um, many that might be considered uh, feminist influences, such as my continual use of conceptualized graphics that represent um, the Virgin Mary and my complicated relationship with an abstracted silhouette um, of the Virgin Mary. So these are images I talk about in my video, um, but you can see this abstracted silhouette of the Virgin Mary um, and how it also resembles a woman in a scarf or, or a hijab. And it also looks like the silhouette on a military weapons range card, especially when the crosshairs are on it. It looks like the halo in the Virgin Mary. And I had experience while I was in Iraq about pointing my weapon at a woman and that complicated relationship between how I felt essentially pointing my weapon at the Virgin Mary. 
And so um, the, I've, I've found meditative line work in my art and it's become sort of a self-inflicted penance for my actions while at war and the internal conflict I continue to process daily about that experience. Um, I know we're probably gonna talk about this, but I just was following the prompts. If I had to describe my artwork in one word, uh, it would be reconciliation. So um, thanks for the invite for being here today. And uh, you can see uh, most of these images on the, the website too. So thank you. Wow, Yvette, wow, you have really like, wow like your your work has uh gone in so many in a very different place than when i was hanging out with you when we were doing a giant fish <laughs> on the wall of fo folks in madison um the, the big fish the uh what is that called uh even uh, the um the what's the coffee place uh Bay lake street coffee house lake street coffee yep thank you uh, if anybody's in Madison <coughs> at Lake at, at, at the uh, coffee house there, that's Yvette's design. Um, ugh, that's what I was saying. We were hot and sweaty and trying to get that up. So it's a very different vibe. I mean, it's obviously appropriate for a community art project, but wow, you're um, being able to have some space now. You've really been able to uh, delve in a very different um, place uh, for your artwork. Yeah, our art worlds, I had kind of wear multiple hats and art, yeah. our art worlds have not intersected on what I mostly have been doing for like the last 15 years. I've, I've known you in the mural art sector, which is a little in a bit community, more. Yeah, in a happy community art. Yeah, it's my escapism, I think. <laughs> right, right. Community engagement. Well, here we are. I mean, that was already uh, uh awesome right there with just the introductions um we have about another 15 minutes to answer a couple of questions before we get to anybody who's on the uh webinar here if they want to ask questions at about 4 30 but i'm just curious i think most of you um explained like the messages or themes in your art but if you could explain like in one or two sentences why do you make the art that you do um and you know the quite like we could all be you know making glass frog glass mosaic frogs and selling them or we could all be doing i don't know uh i don't know making plates and uh, pottery plates and selling those but we're nobody is doing that not saying that it's bad but it's like why are you doing your specific kind of of um art the, the specific kind of visual art so um like why that medium and why those messages i know you touched on it but if you could do it say it again in a couple of sentences that would be great for the audience mara why film i know why you're film? i know you're a visual artist too you're great at that but why did you pick film so for, for me it's actually very it's a very easy question to answer because i always tell people that i became a filmmaker so my education and my previous career was actually in finance. And I became a filmmaker specifically to make my first film, the film that you were talking about, The Muslims I Know, which came out in 2008. And the reason for that was that post 9-11, I felt that everyone was talking about Islam and Muslims. Um, you know, So we were definitely put under the microscope, but no one wanted to hear from us. It's like we were completely disappeared from public discourse. And so the only way to break through that wall was to me, was to make a film, a documentary, which would provide a platform to people to be able to speak for themselves. So that, that's why I became a filmmaker. Yeah, but you could have become, you could have done, you could become a mural artist. You could have uh, done it with uh, textiles and weaving. Why do you think film called you just because of the ability for dialogue in a different way or? Yeah, I think film is just very powerful because we do live in a culture that's very um, focused on seeing, you know, seeing is believing. Yeah. Um, and so I felt that if I could make a documentary just, that was, uh, you know, self-financed, uh, then I would be able to provide this platform to people to have dialogue with one another. And so film just seemed to be a very powerful medium. And also I love film. I mean, I never thought I would be able to make them because this, it seems like <laughs> such a 
complex thing, but you know, it's also something that I absolutely love. And also I, I have to say like, I just make art because like you said, I, I'm a multimedia artist. So I use a lot of different media. Like I do audio now and all kinds of things. And I think for me, art is just, I make art because I exist. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's my way of having a conversation with the world and with life, which is constantly shifting and changing and so multidimensional that it's, for me, it's a way to kind of sort things out and understand them is through art. Thank you. Michaela, why digital art? Well, you did explain a little bit why it has to be digital art, but you could be like knitting. Uh, but why specifically do you- did you Sorry, I had to unmute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was trying to answer. <laughs> um, well, um, yeah, first of all, um, Mara, I'm very interested in your, <laughs> in your film. I'm gonna have to check that out. Um, but uh, second, um, so yeah, digital art was specifically interesting to me um, because yes, the, um, the issue of being, stu being stuck in bed uh, because I was interested in drawing. Um, it, I actually wasn't interested in drawing at first. Um, it took a while. Um, I, was, um, I wasn't interested in drawing at all for a long time but um I, I, but then I was bored in bed you know I was it, what what was there to do I was disabled and sick in bed as a teenager what do I what to do um but then um specifically um I want to talk about what got me interested in um because we we know why I got interested in digital art but um I'm more interested in talking about what got me interested in um what what got me interested in um specifically like um why i draw um uh, like specifically uh what got me into like yeah. why i draw what i do now yeah perfect like, yeah um because the, the the drawing is just that's a tool but um i draw mm -hmm. um specifically these portraits um now um it's because uh, like my biggest motivator um became um is the serious lack of representation you know um uh, of uh for disabled people because when i began began my disabled beauty series um it used to be called the cripple punk um that's right series. that's right uh -huh. uh -huh. It, it was um inspired by the movement by the late tyler truella um and I, I personally really struggled to find art that made me feel how that movement made me feel, um, it, independent and proud and beautiful. Um, and just like, um, and if I could give that feeling to just like one other person, um, then I would be doing right by the world, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's what I told myself anyway, but, um, yeah, by today, um, I've had people come to me and tell me that, my, you know, my art has made a difference to them and how they see themselves. So like, the re representation does make a big difference. Um, <laughs> so that's it, it, it does like, Oh, yeah, you're everybody on this call can uh, <laughs> on this webinar, totally understand yeah. where you're coming from, for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, where do you see the themes going? Well, first of all, is Cripple Punk still happening or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's still there. It's still, right. a, it's still a thing. Um, after, after Tyler passed away, um, it got a little bit, a little wavery. Um, you know, it, it's a little hard. It, it, it's difficult when, you know, when people pass away, but it happens especially in a community full of, you know, disabled people, sick and disabled mm -hmm. people, it, it happens. And there's been a lot of deaths in the past few years, especially it's been, it's been hard. Um, but the community lives on. Um, we're still strong and going, <laughs> but um, yeah, we're, it's just about, um, you know, the premise is just, um, living just uh, living and being yourself um and um it, it's pushing back against that um 
a, a, against that um, idea of um, like um, how how people will treat you infantilize people who are disabled and look down on people who are disabled have this perspective and it's just fighting against that and being your own person having an ident identity for sure it's all about that and the disabled beauty series kind of grew from that became its own thing but purple punk is still very much important to me it's still a part of my life um i just kind of i, I moved um the the new portrait series is kind of just grown from that to be a little bit more inclusive um mm -hmm. to more people but it's still got its roots there great mm -hmm. thank you so much mm -hmm. all right tl why why uh, well you, technically i guess your medium is pen and ink i'm actually a digital illustrator so everything that i do is also digital mm -hmm. did you start pen and did you start with pen I started as an oil painter initially. I went to school and have my UW or my uh, BFA in oil painting, but made a quick right turn away from that. Because? Um, for so many different reasons. <laughs> like I used to be, or like very much into illustration before I went into art. That's what got me into art. And then going, I, I'm sure a couple of us in this room, if you uh, went to school for art, you might have, um, illustration was a bad word in art school when I went to school uh, in 2008 to 2013. And so it was kind of knocked out of me. And so I stopped doing illustration and then graduated and then worked for AMOCA, uh, Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. And then that burnt me out and finally was like, I need to go back to doing the thing I really want to do, which is illustration. And now it's been five years. <laughs> We're doing OK. Wow. And why do you think you pick the themes that you do? Well, um, so for example, with the like recent like comics, uh, this is something that I'm really hoping to dive into moving forward is these like political comics and informative educational comics um, to inspire progress in communities. Uh, that came because I grew up in a really fiscally conservative Republican family. Um, and we talked about politics constantly. And now I'm a really loud, mouthy progressive. <laughs> um, but I used to be Republican when I was younger. And I think having that kind of panoramic perspective on American politics is what has given me a really like interesting voice. And um, I was watching this interview with Donald Glover while he was talking about his TV show Atlanta. And like, that's a really weird, uncomfortable sort of like um, insight into black people living in Atlanta and the weird like Twin Peaks kind of weirdness of Atlanta. And they were asking like, why are you doing this? And his response was because we're the only ones who can do this. Yeah. And I sort of, I that hit really hard for me and I feel very similarly of, I think that the reason that I do illustration and I pick the topics that I do is because of these lived experiences. It is the way that I can share new uh, perspectives. And in post 2020, we are in a land of connection, right? All we wanna do is connect with each other. And that is the, I don't know, my activism and my, I mean, I'm, I'm already looking at politics constantly. I might as well put it into a, um, a more digestible uh, visual representation of these very complex subjects. And that's something that I can do that not a lot of people can do. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. All right, Della. Della, <laughs> why collage? Well, I don't just do collage. I also paint. I also draw. And I think for me is why women, okay? Wow. all right. Um, you know, obviously I am a woman, but the thing why I chose, black, you know, why I particularly chose bl black women, because there are many black women that were very important throughout my life. Um, there was my godmother, Mrs. Frances Larson, 
uh, several te teachers, Mamie, you know, Mamie Foster, Mrs. Miller, and later later on, there are you know people like Toni Morrison, uh, Fannie Lou Hame Hamer, um, and and others. And stories are very important to me, and I think I want to tell Black women stories from my my you know my perspective. And being a black woman in you know, in America, you're constantly told what's wrong with you, but a lot of things would to me it's 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 powerful. And plus, also I've learned from other people's stories. Um, and I do collage, and I'll mention the collage why I like collage, collages. Uh, number one, one of my favorite artists is two of my favorite artists are Romar and Matisse, but. What I like about collage, and I, you know, and I do assemblages sometimes too, is how you take nothing, you know, to make a piece of art. And I like to think, like when I think about, I mean, you know, my people, black people, we took, you know, even when they didn't give us anything, we took nothing and we made something out of it. We made something. We can make something beautiful. We make something par powerful. So, you know. For me, it's about telling the story and taking things, you know, looking at things differently. And and I think that's what we do too much. I think that's one thing we do too much wrong is, you know, society. We don't want to talk to each other. We don't want to find each other's stories. And I remember years ago, a friend of mine had a boyfriend and he was, he would let him, she would let him push him around. And I was a very angry young woman and people would say oh no you weren't my family will tell you yeah yeah don't mess with me well anyway she had this boyfriend and he would let he would let her push she thought he was weak and he went and told told me this and this made a very profound impact on, on my life he said I know people talk about me and said I'm weak he said the reason why I do not lose my temper because I don't want to go to jail. He said, I almost beat a man to death. And he says, I, you know, I had to realize that I had the power to control myself and not, you know, not let others determine me. So, you know, that's where a lot of my inspiration come from. People that, you know, people that I've met before and, um, you know, that's it. All right. And this is interesting that you went straight to, to the subject of women in your work because didn't you also study women and gender studies uh, back at back? Yes, in I was. Yeah, actually, had I not stepped into an art career, I would be a psychologist and my major was sociology. Um, I was getting a certificate in women's studies and I was doing a minor in African-American African-American studies. And actually all of that influenced my, you know, my work. And also what a lot of people don't know about me either. I used to be a union steward. I was very much an activist in my union. I also would fight for reproductive rights. I also worked with nine to five, fighting, fighting for women's rights. So this, you know, it's, yeah, it's been a part of my DNA, but, a lot, and that's because there's been a lot of people, men and women, that have, you know, that have influenced me. Right. Thank you so much, Della. Christy, why your uh, mediums or why your themes? Yeah, the the pieces that I shared um, with this, um, with the conference, uh, really are my feelings of oppression and shame. Um, after the road uh, turnover. And if you see the piece with the Supreme Court, you can see the pressure of that coming down on me or the piece with all the sperm where the hand is coming over my mouth and shutting me up. Um, so part of what I'm trying to focus on is more about the feeling and compassion um, and having a better understanding that we need to stop shaming and blaming women. Um, and really, I'm hoping that my work can, can contribute to the dialogue in general um, and having more of a conversation. I think we tend to focus, um, not we, but <laughs> uh, uh, you know, society focuses on, you know, just is it pro-life or pro-choice? And I think what I'm trying to do is um, 
think have us think differently and and talk more also about um, some of the other work that I have is really trying to um, unpack some of the other issues. Why don't we have better health care? Why do we have food deserts? Why are there women who can't get to good health care? You know, why isn't there not free birth control? Why are we not improving um, paid family leave? Um, so I'm trying to explore and unpack those types of themes. Um, and really, I think I'm an educator at heart. And as an example, I met with 20 students today, undergraduate students, and did a, a kind of a talk about this, the topic and shared my work and did a little demo. And um, they really talked a lot about sex education and how uh, the things that they were told as um, you, you know, in high school that that was really more about abstinence. And, and so as you start down these rabbit holes of all these issues, um, I'm trying to bring those to light. Um, and uh, through my printmaking and, uh, you, you know, I really am trying to do that. I think the other piece that's really important to me is right now has been the process of making itself. And I do a lot of collage, like if you see the piece with the sperm, I sat and cut out thousands of sperm to then affix to the canvas. And there is a meditative healing process for me in the place where I am uh, in my life, where um, this is my, the first time I've never worked since I was 15. So to have time to be introspective and to be meditative and that sense of craft and you know, cutting little teeny pieces out almost to make a whole. It's kind of like I'm taking this fragmented way I, that I have evolved to, to making myself a new whole. And um, so the process itself is also important. But for me, the message is also very important. And as I'll continue my last year in my program, my thesis focus and topic is um, reproductive control or injustice um, and, and themes around that. Wonderful. Very cool. Uh, Kirsten, uh, why dolls? Um, well, more, more than that. I mean, why, <laughs> why mixed media? Why, why dolls? Why, why actually, are, you explain this to me. Why articulating dolls? Um, well, I, I, always, I also always make characters with my art. So um, I started drawing as long as, as far as I can remember, I was always drawing. And I went to school for graphic design, like uh, T.O. was mentioning, like illustration. I, there were no illustration classes. Um, you either had to do graphic design or fine art. And I thought that that's what I had to do was graphic design, because I thought that if I wanted to have a career in art, it needed to be some sort of a professional career. So I... I started there and when I graduated, I realized that it just wasn't for me. I didn't want to do that. And I went back to what I really love to do, which is just drawing and making these small personal illustrations of women, uh, women that have bodies like me and women who you may not see being praised in society for like large bellies, um, dark skin, hair, like textured like mine and things so don't you I say you also include stretch marks yeah. yeah I mean I I bring that up because people don't usually put stretch marks on their art mm -hmm. I, I love that you have that okay. yeah I think I, I one of the my favorite compliments that I would get from someone is that they never see art that looks like them and they actually like relate to this doll just putting on her pants um, getting dressed with a robe open, that kind of thing. So these intimate kind of moments that I want people to be able to see a, a doll of that, like a beautiful people, dolls are these beautiful little things that people play with. So just to say, you know, you only see a doll a certain way. Like I grew up in the eighties and nineties. So if you wanted a Barbie, you had to get a blonde, tall, blue eyed Barbie. So you didn't get someone that looked like me or my mom or my sisters. So doll making, um, I, for me, the art, whatever I'm doing. So if I'm drawing, painting, that's my preferred language, I guess. I I feel like I get, <laughs> I stumble when I'm trying to speak. I'm, I can write things really well, but I really 
feel like I express how I feel about things best through what I, when I draw and when I make things. So that's mm. why. Thank you. Yvette, why printmaking? Uh, I have been drawing and painting since I was, could hold a pencil. And so when I discovered printmaking, I went back to art school when I got out of the army and I didn't, I had never, I had never heard about printmaking or what printmaking was. A friend of mine had a lithograph in her house uh, before I joined the army. And I remember being drawn to it and really loving it. So when I got back to school, I saw a printmaking class and I took it and I fell in love with the process. And as I started learning more about printmaking, and then as I developed the veteran print project, it was a method, to, it was a means to an end in some ways, because we were trying to get local printmakers um, more attention for our local printmaking cooperative. And I was trying to get my student veteran group some their voices heard and so we paired that's how the veteran print project started was pairing those two groups together so uh, what I found after a couple of years doing the project is that printmaking mimics the military experience so I always explain to people it's it's a lot of uh, you have to have a lot of discipline to be a printmaker uh, there's a lot of unknown outcomes uh, you have to have what we call in the military intestinal fortitude you have to adapt, improvise, and overcome. And at the end, the result of printmaking is to spit out multiples of the same thing, which is what the army is getting you to do. Uh, and even though you're, you're creating an addition of the multiple, uh, each print is an original because it still has its own unique characteristics. It still retains its individual form. Um, so even though it's a part of a whole, and looks like everything else, it still has its own individual components. And that's what how I feel when you serve in the military, there's a lot of programming that goes on, uh, psychological and, and, and you know, we, that's a whole nother conversation, but we all still hopefully retain our own identity. And it's when you start to lose that identity that you need to worry. So when you, when, when you, you, you sort of follow that map in the military of, of, how I, I I don't know, I don't, I, but I, I'm just saying is that the printmaking mimics the military experience. And so that's why I've stuck with it because it challenges me as well. Uh, I love drawing uh, with all my heart uh, and I love painting, but it comes so naturally that it's like driving. I don't remember how I got from point A to point B because <laughs> this is what I do. But in printmaking, I have to think every step of the way. And because of that, uh, it it helps me process on a deeper level. And, and that communication then translates to explaining the, the artwork to, to other people as we're, we're able to create a multiple. So we're also able to distribute to the masses. So you, you can affect one person on a gallery wall, but then when you distribute the prints, you can affect many. And that's why printmaking has always been used as a social justice tool as well. Very cool. Whoa, well, Stephanie, I mean, come on, what a panel, right? This is such a great panel. I can't spotlight because we have so many panelists. So um, I'm just gonna speak from up here, but um, this was such a fantastic panel and the, the virtual artist exhibition is such a, a phenomenal addition to the conference and all of your work as we were going through just speaks to so many themes in such a nuanced and, nuanced and intersectional way. Um, so it's, it's such an honor to have this great group of people here and to hear about your work. And I loved hearing you connect with each other and like seeing your expressions and enthusiasm and moments of recognition when, um, you heard something that someone else said. So, um, I just want to thank you all for joining us today, um, for this great round table. Thank you, Gabrielle, for your fantastic facilitation. Your other questions were great. We just didn't really get to them. Um, but they're kind of answered in the work. Like mm -hmm. how does feminine feminism influence your work? Um, you know, what type of themes are you foregrounding? I think we really get a lot of that from the virtual artist exhibition. Yeah, and I also, the other question, if we would have had a time was, what, what drew them to the topic of, of um, uh, artful hope and hopeful art? Mm -hmm. You know, that's that would have been another question. I Because that was uh, hopeful art and artful hope, because that's kind of uh, going off the theme of the conference. But do we have any questions, uh, Stephanie? 
Um, we don't have any Q and A right now, um, and I, I think that the dialogue was really great. So I think we're we're just gonna wrap up now. We've been here for an hour and fifteen minutes, and I think we've covered a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I also want to thank our interpreters and our captioner for such great work. Um, Carla Strand and Lydia Ruchtal were doing a great job um, populating the chat. Um, Martino has been doing support behind the scenes, who's one of our GWS interns. And then um, again, that virtual artist exhibition is all um, Lydia's work. Um, so make sure you check that out. Um, we'll make this um, available um, for folks to see after the fact too, so people can watch this video alongside the exhibition. But um, thank you so much. We have one more day of events tomorrow. We're starting out with yoga and uh, Chloe uh, Lanau Diamond or Diamond Lanau is um, done yoga for us before and her session this year is tender gender restorative yoga a praxis of feminist queer and decolonial somatics so we're starting that at nine tomorrow and then at 10 15 we have the African American Health Network and the Foundation for Black Women's Wellness and they have a really great topic um, this year on equitable breast cancer prevention and treatment and um, then we're closing out after some concurrent ses sections um, with an intersectional outlook on sex work, decriminalization, and communal liberation. So another great day of events. A lot of it speaks to your work. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for everybody who's been with us um, for the last two days. And we'll see everyone who can make it tomorrow. Thank you Bye. so much, Stephanie. Thank you, GWS.